Welcome to Revere Asset Management's Your Money with Danny Stewart. The market will always overshoot to the downside and to the upside. And Don Vandenborn. Because it's not how much you make in the markets, it's how much of that you can keep. Is this the new normal for interest rates? Or have we simply forgotten what normal is? And will your 401ks be gone in a decade? There's a new push to abolish 401k, so you better pay attention. Google Gemini AI stands for artificial ignorance, according to Don Vandenborn and many others. And is there a ticking time bomb in commercial real estate and banking? We've talked about that for months. And now you see a whole plethora of articles coming out this week because banks are starting to have a little bit of problems and commercial real estate is starting to struggle and payments are starting to get more. Some of the payments are starting to slow up. So anyway, there's articles on that. You can look and Teddy bull is going to talk about SMCI and the potential blow off top. How should you handle? And the big top of, of the day, are you an Icarus investor? And should you have listened to Daedalus? If you're a Greek mythology buff, you'll know what that means. But the moral of the story is don't fly too close to the sun. Don't fly too high. Don't go with all those growthy names all the time unless you have a plan. But the first announcement, the big, big, big announcement is Michael Ramos is leaving Revere at the end of this month. We love Michael. We wish him the best and we hope he finds what he's looking for. And Michael, why don't you tell them what's what's going on and what's what's the new phase and what are you doing? Yeah, so it's it's sad. Um, not super thrilled about it. I've I've really enjoyed my time at Revere. I've been here almost two years. It's crazy how how time flies when you're having fun. And I've definitely had a lot of fun. It's been an incredible experience. But in terms of what I'm looking for, it's not it, it's not so much. Um, a job function issue it's more just unfortunately based on the setup me being the only one in california and um, not having uh, a local office or a team out here in in california i mean with the pandemic covid's really changed everything and when i was in school i did the last uh, two years of school from home and then went straight into a job and have been at home for the last four years just working on my own and um just over that time um definitely feel as though I, I needed a change and needed to get out of the home and into an office and sort of working with people in person and and um that's that's the unfortunate circumstance and um because of that um it's just uh yeah with, with revere based out of uh, florida and texas um I, I just don't have that opportunity here um so that's that's the reason, but I mean, what an incredible experience. I've, this has been an amazing team to work with. Um, we'll definitely be in contact and, um, it's, uh, it's almost be, become like family to me and, um, the new guys, I, I feel the timing's good as well because I mean, Ted and Connor le definitely leaving Revere in, in great hands, um, between Ted, Connor, Don and Dan and the whole team. Um, yeah, it's, and we're in a bull market. Revere is performing super well. So, um, uh, yeah, uh, definitely well, leaving we, Revere in good hands. So, yeah, no, yeah. We, we appreciate that, folks. And look, look, Revere is a hybrid situation. Our home office, our, 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 our physical office is in DFW, actually, Allen, North Dallas, if you want to get technical. Okay. And then we, then Don and the guys are out in Florida. And then Michael is the, the lone person out in, in Beverly Hills and, and in LA and we just don't have a physical presence out there at all. And he kind of got tired of working in his apartment for 10, 12 hours, you know, working long hours and just not getting any social. So he's got a new job with an investment firm out in LA where they've got hundreds of people working there. It's a big outfit. He's going to get to go and he's going to be a, be an analyst. He's going to be an analyst. And so it's going to be a, a pretty cool deal. So Mike, we wish you well. And actually Mike is actually going to be doing that Icarus topic in just a short bit. 
very quickly. But but first, I, I got a couple articles, and I want to go to the mailbag, and then I want to dive right into the markets. This new normal that we're talking about. This guy wrote an article, and it, it, it you know we've been talking about this for a while. Yeah, the cost of money is going up. Here's kind of the funny part about the article. He said, you know, the good news, potentially the good news is yes. Interest rates are causing people to pay more and when they roll over debt, borrow more. But because the Fed is kind of paused and they're not going to continue raising, you at least know approximately where the interest rates are going to be for corporate planning or for individual planning for borrowing. So even though you may not like these rates and you wish they were lower, at least some corporations can do some planning. So he says, so however, if you've been delaying a purchase or investment in hopes of, of timing a drop in rates here, maybe it's time to reconsider. Maybe you need to just do it now. And his next sentence says, don't ever try, time, try to time the financial markets ever. What? He just said, maybe it's time to lock in a rate, but don't try to time them. Okay, whatever. Anyway, point, point is, interest rates aren't going up anymore. Well, not significantly going up anymore. And it's probably leaning toward dropping. Right now, bonds just had a big pop just a few minutes ago. Whatever it is, it doesn't matter. Bonds are acting a little bit better. Now, also your 401k, is it gonna be gone in a decade? There's a new push to kind of do uh, 401k, well, to do things like they do in Europe. And you can still put uh, money, you can still withhold money off your payroll, off your employee's check. It just happens to, it, you just pay the tax on it first. So the politicians get their money up front and then they have a little side account where you can invest. And it's just like a broke account. So there's an article on that if you want to read that. And then there's three articles on the interest rates and, or I'm sorry, the banks and the commercial loans and the problems thereof. We, I've talk, we talked about that months ago, that this was coming down the pike and now you're starting to see a, a few little problems. So that's what you got to keep in mind. This guy's talking about, remember Lehman Brothers, Bear Stearns, and even Madoff, when rates got tight, when rates get high, that's when you flush out the frauds. That's when you flush out the weaker hands and even companies that are okay, but they're just not well managed. Like Warren Buffett said, uh, when things get tough, when you go into recession, then you know who's not wearing a swimsuit. It's like low tide at the beach. You know who's not wearing a swimsuit, right? But um, what this guy is talking about is how Silicon Bank and a couple of these other banks just recently went down pretty quick. Anyway, you can read all those. Those are in the show notes. I don't want to dive into that too deep, but you're welcome to read those. I want to go into the show notes or the mailbag, excuse me, because we got a great question. And it actually kind of goes sort of kind of like Michael's topic. He wants the in-office experience. This guy's actually a client, loves us, but he's kind of, and he's trying to spread the word and tell people about us, but it's kind of hard because he's out of state. He's not in Texas or Florida. Anyway, good morning, Revere staff. It seems like the dumbest question ever on the surface, but stay with me here. I'm obviously a client. Sometimes I share your videos with people. It seems a little odd that I sent my nest egg over to you. I've spoken to different staff members and follow you on social platforms. You put out great content. I've never met in person, but I believe in what you're doing and doing it in the big picture. I tell some, if I tell someone I sent money to these cool guys I have never met who I found on the internet, wouldn't I look crazy? Okay. I, I, I don't doubt you're legitimate. It's just hard to explain to people why I trust what you are doing. How would you explain to somebody why it makes sense for them to send money or where they have never met anyone or been to a branch. Sorry for the ramblings. I'm just trying to get my head around uh, this. Always thought how crazy people were for trusting Bernie Madoff. He had great cover, even fooled the regulators for a long time. He had, he had also had many clients way more sophisticated than myself. Again, as a client, I apologize for my ignorance, but I'd like to spread the word about what you do. Thinking about how... This would sound when I explain to someone, but I believe in what you're doing. Me, JP, it is a great question, but one that can be easily answered. 
I've copied Revere, the Revere team because it never hurts to reinforce and clarify our fiduciary stance. First of all, we do not custody assets. But one, I'm sorry, we do not custody assets as the assets are held at Schwab. We are simply able to execute trades on your behalf and bill for management fees. This is known as limited power of attorney versus full power of attorney where they can send money to third party, they can do whatever. They've got full discretion on your account, okay? Which uh, some adver advisory firms allow. I have never allowed Revere full power of attorney, only LPOA. That's how I set it up to begin with in 2010. In fact, this is what allows us to be a fiduciary in the first place. If we had full POA, we would not be a fiduciary. Having your assets with an advisor that has full POA or a broker at a brokerage firm, including Charles Schwab Fidelity or the discount brokers, right? They like to be called custodians now, excuse me. They don't like to be called broker dealers anymore because it sounds like a used car salesman. Is where your risk are. Taking it a step further, the maximum management fee by regulators is 3%. We are well under that. But the most we could, quote, run off with before Schwab getting alerted or getting caught would be 3%. And if there is any fraud or embezzlement, Schwab is on the hook as they are the custodians responsible for custody of assets. The reason you set now this is a, another point that's even as salient. The reason you separate custody from the advice is then there are no conflicts of interest, assuming you have a fiduciary advisor. Okay. Not only does this protect the client from high commission, long surrender penalty products and bad advice, it also protects against malfeasance getting Madoff. In fact, the reason Bernie Madoff uh, was able to Madoff everyone is because he was actually both the brokerage firm, the custodian holding the assets, and the advisor. Everyone with a Series 7, a broker-dealer's license, if you're at Schwab, Merrill Lynch, any of those, you got your Series 7. Everyone with Series 7 and 65, both, has that conflict. What I am telling you is that you have far more risk with a broker, we are not a broker, at a brokerage firm where he is the captive agent than a fiduciary advisor where you have separation of duties. Separate the advice from the custody. I set up Revere back in 2010 as a fiduciary advisor with limited power to protect the client so they don't get mad off. Um, a, few, a, a few other facts. Uh, we are a SEC registered investment advisor that goes through regulatory audits. We just passed one six months ago with flying colors. Um, um, I have never, uh, I have never had a, a client complaint. Me, I've never had a client complaint in all my 30 years. Of course, I am biased, but my personal opinion is that Revere is far more eco ethical than a Ray J, Edward Jones, Fidelity, Schwab brokerage firms at all, um, and definitely more than insurance companies. When people question you, ask them how much due diligence did they do with the firm that they are with now? And how many complaints does their firm have? You could ask them, um, or if they simply rely on name recognition. That's what 99% of the people do. You could ask them if they trust Charles Schwab, because that's where their assets are held. We're not holding them. Sorry, this was a long-winded answer, but I wanted to be uh, give you a complete answer. Cheers and have a good weekend. That was very, very important. All right, this is another client. I just looked at my 1090, my two 1099 statements, um, both held at Revere, both the retirement accounts. So I'm confused why I'm receiving a 1099 because I'm not reporting any taxable gains or losses. She's not retired yet. She's not taking any distributions. Me. They report 1099s even on IRAs, even though they are irrelevant, at least you take, until you take a distribution. It will not impact your taxes until, until you take a distribution. So it was for reporting purposes only. Uh, so you don't really have to worry about it. My CPA doesn't even care about them. All right. Uh, this is the last one. 
Hi, Don. Uh, this is RS222. Just wanted to, again, thank you for tonight's videos. They are always very insightful and helpful. I really see how much analysis you're putting into your money management. Uh, I liked and found your comments about using leveraged ETFs, SSO, SPXL, and QLD, and how they have become very much a backbone of your strategy, and then adding on some individual stocks only when they can outperform. Thank you very much for your insights and comments. Have a great weekend. Uh, Don, thanks, RS. Notes like yours give us the fuel to keep doing what we were doing, getting a little bit better each and every day. We appreciate your support. Folks, if you've got any questions or comments or you've got a, a stock you want discussed on the show or you just want a, a topic you want discussed, please reach out to us. I'll put it on the mailbag. We'll, we'll talk about it. Okay, so with any with, with that backdrop, now what I want to do is I want to go to are you an Icarus investor? Now, just for the backdrop, for those of you who don't, I was Greek mythology fanatic and oh my God. And, and I went to Vanderbilt. I made a hundred and it was the only uh, class I never studied for at all. Never cracked a book. <laughs> anyway, um, um, Icarus was, Daedalus was the guy that built the labyrinth, you know, with the minotaur and the bull and all that stuff. And so, but he had this, uh, uh, and so the king stuck Daedalus in there when he built it so that no one would know how to get out because uh, theoretically he's the only one to go out. And his son, Icarus, was in there. Daedalus built him some wings with wax, made out of wax for the, to, to secure the wings and told him to go fly away to, to escape. Now, what he told him is don't fly too close to the sea because the feathers will get wet and you'll fall into the water and drown. Don't fly too high or close to the sun because it will melt your wax. So you want to take the middle of the road. You want to not too high, not too low, not too hot, not too cold. You want to take the middle of the road and you'll be safe and sound. So with that backdrop of Icarus, Michael, I want you to explain what you uh, 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 want to talk about and the article that you saw. Before I get into that, um, a, a little piece of trivia that I thought was interesting because you mentioned that you had done so well in your courses. I was wondering if you or anyone on the team knew uh, what the phrase, well, passing with flying colors, where that comes from. Passing with flying colors. No, I don't know it. I would think that's military, uh, military. Um, um, yeah, close. So, yeah. so it's interesting. Yeah, it's back in the day um, when ships would go out to discover new land or into battle, they'd return home with their flags that were also called colors. And it was, uh, they passed with, with flying colors. They returned home with their, with their flags. So I thought that was- So cool. they made it, yeah. Where, where that <laughs> comes from. Yeah, they made it back um, through something very challenging, so. Yeah, but now going to um, to Icarus, so it's really a perfect, um, I guess, uh, explanation or, or analogy for what happens and um, in relation to ARC and the, these other mutual funds and and um, fund per performers, fund managers that perform super super well one year, they fly a little close to the sun, and they get burned. And um, yeah, so getting into ARC. Uh, there's an article here on Reuters that says ARK Investments tops Morningstar list of wealth destroying ETF issuers. And the article says that US listed ETFs managed by ARK management have wiped out a total of $14.3 billion in shareholder value over the 10 years ended December 31st, 2023. And this is more than double the estimated total losses incurred by each of the next four fund families on Morningstar's list. And the reason for that is if you look at ARK's performance, they did super, super well during 2019, 2020, they were up uh, double digits, triple digits even. And what happened is that most people ended up chasing that performance and they saw most of their inflows at the top and towards the top. So even though their performance, they're, they're kind of flat over pretty much since inception, they're, they're up slightly, haven't done too much. They're not really down. It's, it's more the timing and when people entered those funds. So ARC, uh, and then here getting into some more data to show this, this Icarus, uh, I guess, um, issue is that 
So in 2020, ARC was up 152.82%, which was the top fund, the, the, the largest, they, they were absolutely crushing it. And then they posted losses of 26.38% in 2021 and 66.97% in 2022. And although it outperformed most ETFs in 2023 with the gain of 67.64%, it still saw outflows and is down another 10% so far in 2024. And basically the issue with that is that Kathy Wood says her strategy, she's very, very confident that they'll outperform uh, over the long haul, even in the face of big losses. But what you'll notice, if you look at these mutual funds, the, the list of the top performers is very, very inconsistent. You look at the top performers and on an annual basis, the top five, you almost never see the same fund year over year in the top fund. The, the, the names are constantly changing. And what's interesting is that the same way that Icarus was advised to fly in between that middle path, in between the sun and the, and the sea, if you look at consistently over time mutual funds, like take for example, Berkshire Hathaway, or I mean, yeah, you, you, you can look at the performance, but if you find the ones that are sort of in the middle that consistently perform, they stick to a strategy, they're not performance chasing, they're not changing based on what's in vogue. They're kind of, they, they've established themselves over time. They actually are the top performing ones. So it's, it's more consistency is key. It's, it's like the tortoise and the hare similar story you don't ever very rarely do you top the list and and consistently perform over time you want to be somewhere in the middle take your time there's no there's no race to the finish line just make sure you're doing what you're supposed to be doing sticking to your rules and your strategy and over time that's that's how you perform and it's really evident here with arc and pretty much any other mutual fund that that tops that list um go ahead and, and check it out you can find it on morningstar it's it's really interesting to look over that data and see all right thanks mike listen do me a favor send me that e article i want to add that in the show notes i meant to add that and i forgot i didn't see it so if you haven't sent it already right send it in there and i'll i'll stick it in right after the show um folks here's here's this is a story this is a true story so in the 90s, it was like December 1999 or, or January of 2000. I was back in San Antonio and I had a show there. And I was I was interviewing Art Bonell of the Bonell Growth Fund. He was the darling of Wall Street. Everybody loved him. He was one of the top performing. He had Dell and WorldCom and all these high flyers. Dell got so bad later, it got, had to be delisted. WorldCom went belly up and bankrupt. So there's no such thing as a buy and hold and stick it in your drawer and forget it, right? But it, it, during the commercial break, he leaned over to me and he said, Danny, I don't know what I'm going to do. I got $30 million of new money in the last three to four weeks. I said, well, Art, that sounds like a good problem to have. Why, why, why is that a big deal? He said, you don't understand. I've got to go buy tech stocks at these valuations. So he admitted to me, and that's when I was early in my career, I just like, wow, I could have had a V8. I realized he was telling me he thought prices were way, way too high and they were too extended, but he still by his perspective, because remember, you're not the client of the mutual fund or the ETF. You're not the client. The client is the fund, the prospectus of the fund. They've got to be fully invested either in 90 or 90%, 5% technology at all times. They can't move to 50% cash. They can't get defensive. They can't sell all their tech stocks, even if tech stocks are crashing. So in any event, what Art told me is basically I'm selling in my own portfolio, but I'm buying, I have to buy for this fund. That's the same thing with this, with behavioral finance. So part of it is these funds are wildly volatile, these high flying growth funds. So you've got to have a sell discipline. That's why we have protection. Grow when it's pretty good, protect and get defensive when it's down. But it's not just the fact that these high flying funds have these huge peaks and valleys. It's the investors, the behavioral finance, people performance chase and they race after these funds and they buy in close to the top and then they all get burned. We've owned ARC before. We've owned it for short periods and then we sell it. We do not. ARC is not a buy and hold for sure. Okay. Leading stocks on average fall 72% from their top in a bear market. 
So a lot of because the lead, the best of the best, those are the first places these hedge funds are going to take or institutional money is going to take profit. So anyway, that's a great article, but it also is a great segue in to talk, let Don talk about what's going on in the markets and how he handles it, because that kind of dovetails with protection. And right now, it's kind of a good time. The market's acting right. But how long will that last? And what is the plan for when it does it? So with that, Don, I set the table for you. I want to see you hit a grand slam. Sure, Dan. Um, <laughs> well, I, I mean, I say it every night in the videos, you know, grow protection made up of two words. It's a play on the word protection, but we're going to grow assets when the market's in an uptrend and we're going to protect them when markets are in a downtrend. We uh, lost significantly less than the market uh, during the 2022 uh, bear market. We had fantastic gains during the uh 2020 and 2021 move higher after COVID. We were up 20, over 20% in the last three plus months during this uh, rally, which has really featured the type of that we uh, traffic in, uh, you know, growth stocks within something within N, the N in CanSlim, which is something new that changes the way we work, play, uh, live our lives. And, um, it's it's important to understand that when you look at a chart pattern, uh, and let's bring up NVIDIA because it's pretty much one of the big market leaders right now. Uh, you find this chart pattern over and over again, but what makes the stock go up 40% uh, in a couple of weeks? It's not the chart pattern, it's the story behind the company as it forms these different patterns. And NVIDIA right now very clearly produces the GPUs that are being used in data center and companies are rushing to, uh, for these data centers to host their applications as they integrate artificial intelligence into their processes. That is the big N in NVIDIA. That's what made the stock run from 500 to 800 uh, since the breakout at the beginning of the year, there were plenty of other companies that formed a very similar base structure like this that haven't run up this percentage amount. And it's because they do not have this end. Somebody that uh, is looking, is a client of ours, sent me a, a, a newsletter this week uh, full of analysis of the different sectors and um companies within those sectors. And I, it took me about 60 seconds to look at it, And I said, none of these companies that he's showing these chart patterns of uh, have the N. Nothing's, the, a chart pattern's just a chart pattern. It doesn't really mean anything. What's gonna make that higher? A lot of them are also. You gotta have institutional sponsorship to push these stocks higher. You've gotta have the big pension funds, mutual funds, um, actively man TFs to uh, buy these to make it go higher. There's got to be demand. And again, it comes down to what's the end, what's new about this company that's going to push, that's going to push it higher. And back to the markets themselves, we have had a nice, uh, very nice rally since the follow through days that I've been uh, discussing every night uh, on the videos. And uh, we went into a little bit of a pullback recently. And the question is, when, when we see a pullback like this, we don't know if it's going to last for uh, two days, two weeks, two months, or if it's going to put a top in the market. Uh, but we've got sell rules in place. And we had a here's a recent uh, pullback that we had. This green line is very important to us. That's our short term trend line. It's 21 day exponential moving average. And then uh, Wednesday night, NVIDIA uh, posted earnings. They're the preeminent. Uh, AI company producing these GPU chips, as I mentioned, they had a monster gap up uh, after pulling back 10% over the last week and a half. And this this uh, triggered through to the same uh, stocks that are related to AI tech all throughout uh, the stock market universe. And you saw the S&P 500 and the NASDAQ 100 gap above this declining tops trend line and looking to start the next leg up in this rally. We've had one leg up, gone sideways, second leg up, gone sideways, and now broken higher. 
and will ride this continual wave as long as it goes. It's just like surfing. When you get on a wave, you don't know if it's going to take you all the way into shore if, or if it's going to peter out uh, after, you know, a, a few feet or so. You see that all the time. And we don't we don't judge. We just, we're going to, we recognize, we started off with this arrow right here. That's an O'Neill follow through day. Then we've had other subsequent events during this uptrend that have triggered next legs up in the market. This latest one, this latest inflection point, uh, the gap up in the market off of NVIDIA earnings, which kicked all AI and tech stocks higher. And we're just going to continue to ride this wave, not predict about what anybody's gonna do, set our stops in place, watch our equity curve work higher, and more importantly, watch the floor of that equity curve rise because we know when all of our stops get hit, and I talked about this in last night's video, we use something called rebar, revere estimated balance at risk, and right now our drawdown is about 6%. So from the highs that we're making in our accounts as this go higher until all our stops get taken out, that would mean the market tone has changed. Uh, we were taken out of all of our names and our downside is about 6%. So this 20 plus percent gain that we have, the, it, it's, the floor of that is gonna, if we pull back 6%, it'll be a 14% gain and that will indicate a change in character on the market. Um, we won't give back all these gains that we made uh, and then we'll wait for the right characteristics of a market to re-enter again, just like we did back in the beginning of January after this, um, or the beginning of uh, November, after we had this three month pullback that started with the top at the end of July. So it's just okay. using the same rules uh, all the time and um, following Rinsen, them, sticking to them. Ritz and repeat, leave that chart up there. So you made two comments I want you to explain a little bit. You said that little arrow is, a, is an O'Neill follow through. That's how you knew to get in. That's day four. Can you, can you explain that? Can you? Yeah. When, when the market is in correction, we look for uh, a four days, a minimum of four days off the bottom. We look for a move higher in the indexes on increasing volume, and preferably it's a long move. And that's what we saw on November 1st, and then a follow through day on November 2nd. Also, we had back to back follow through days. Uh, and this should coincide with leading stocks setting up and uh, breaking out of bases. And all of those boxes were checked. So we really started getting involved in the market uh, back around this time. One of the first stocks we bought was Deckers. It broke out actually before the follow through day. So you're looking at this time, what stocks are going higher, what sectors are leading, what industry groups are leading. And then we position our portfolio always with stops in place. And we've been fortunate enough that this has been a very nice, uh, almost a textbook rally off of this follow through day. And it kind of coincided with some interpretation that the Fed was uh, going to ease ease things, uh, some relaxation in interest in uh, inflation, which would lead them to do that. That's really what triggered this back at the beginning of November. And then we just get out of the way, follow our rules, get on board these names. We're not always perfect. We're going to get stopped out on some things that are going to go higher, but we're going to pay attention to the overall tenor and tone of uh, the market and the individual names that go higher. And um, get our money into those names and uh, let them carry us higher. Yeah. Now also, not only did you get that four day follow through and the, that classical O'Neill, you know, four day follow through. Also you had, that was at the same time you were breaking through reclaiming the 200 day moving average. And then those other moving averages are stacking almost in like they're supposed, I mean, they're, they're lining up. So you're breaking through the moving averages. It actually is another indicator that's giving you even more confidence that that move is a legitimate move, that it's not a false break. Great. Yeah. Great point. Leading into this bottom, this is our, uh, the red line here, that's our 50 day moving average. It was in a downtrend that tells us uh, our intermediate term trend is down. So the, the portion of money that we would normally allocate based on the intermediate term trend was sidelined because we were in a downtrend. Then you've got the green line, that's our short term uh, trend line that was also in a downtrend. Uh, the only thing we had left was some money while we were above this 200 day moving average. Then we went below there for about a week. We went to completely uh, on, on the sidelines in cash because we were under all three of the key metrics, uh, the key moving averages, the three time frames that we track. And then when we got back above the 200 day moving average, and then we got back above the short term moving average, then we got back above 
uh, the intermediate term moving average. And little by little, we just keep putting money into the market. It's working. Leading stocks are working. And uh, then, like I said, we just uh, ride the trend higher, ride the wave uh, as far as it takes us. And then right now, we just had a breakout yesterday. Uh, that breakout could fail next week. And if it does, our stops will start taking us out. We'll first break below the 21-day moving average. That'll remove some more money from the market. We'll break below the 50-day moving average. We'll take more money out of the market. And then we'll uh, ride. Uh, we'll watch what happens under the 50-day moving average. Is it temporary? Does the slope of the line flatten out and then roll over like it did back here, which is indicating to us that not only are we under it, but the trend, the slope of that line is down. That's another check mark, so under the uh, check mark in the bearish column. And then we just wait, bide our time, watch for the subsequent follow through day uh, when it happens and engage the overall strength. Are the stocks there uh, to invest in it or is it just a short uh, pop from oversold conditions? Because those happen all the time and those frequently fail, but we've been fortunate enough that this one hasn't and we've been able to ride this uh, pretty well to the upside. So I've got a quick question for you, the listener. If, if unless you're a so, do it yourself or well, even if you're a do it yourself or if you're a do it yourself or are you paying, are you watching it that closely and that focused on the market? And do you have that much knowledge? Maybe a lot of our stock nerds follow the markets, follow us, and they kind of know this stuff. So, but if you're more of a retail investor, you're not a stock nerd, you're not a diehard, you you got an advisor. Does your advisor sound like this? Or do they say, oh, just stay the course. Just The market always comes back. It'll be fine. Don't worry about it. You're in it for the long term. Or my favorite worst line ever, oh, the stock's down 10%. You ought to average down. The question is, how come you didn't sell it yet? How come it, you're letting a single-digit loss turn into double-digit loss? Anyway, it's just a thought. That was a great, great uh, uh explanation don all right do you want to go to ted now or what do you have anything to, do you want to go over a few stocks or what do you, i'll let you drive yeah we're going to take it uh over to ted he's got three charts to show us very relevant to what's going on in the in the current market uh take it away ted a few weeks ago i or like four or five weeks ago i covered three very similar uh chart patterns and setups the first one was nvidia and then we'll go over the Nikkei futures and then SMCI as a third one. And I just want to highlight the, this post breakout action and all three of these names pretty much displayed like 10 out of 10 ideal characteristics post breakout. And so once NVIDIA broke out of the six month base, immediately saw four days up in a row and that's exactly what we want to see post breakout. We want to see follow through buying. So then that indicates to us that is institutional buying instead of just retail buying. And I also marked on this chart that after 15 days, we triggered the ANTS characteristics, which is 12, at least 12 out of 15 days up, 20% plus price move, and a significant 20% plus increase in the average volume of the stock. Um, NVIDIA also uh, saw its relative strength line break into new highs with price as well. And that's just what, that's just what I want to show here for the NVIDIA chart. Um, it was a great, Er, post earnings action yesterday, breaking out to new all time highs and then some decent follow through today as well. So the second one, uh, again, like I talked about in a previous segment that the volatility contraction pattern and these characteristics show up on all assets, uh, timeframes. So this is the Nik Nikkei futures. And as you can see, the six month base is pretty similar to NVIDIA's. And when we broke out of it, we're four days up in a row, which is exactly what we, what we want to see. We didn't hit the ANTS characteristics here, but nevertheless, it's still very powerful. We found support at the 8 and 21 EMAs, and then we quickly moved into new highs. And I believe actually that we made a multi-decade high in the Nikkei yesterday, which is a huge, huge breakout. And we'll see if this continues on. I don't think I've really seen that, that long of a breakout before. Um, so we'll see how it that only acts. took 35 years, yeah. Ted. Only yeah. took 35 <laughs> years to get back to the 1989 highs. One and a half times older than me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then the third one. Yeah, Ted. Ted, you would have been dead before you got back even if you were. Think oh, about yeah. that. It's 34 years, folks. <laughs> if you had retired at 60, you're 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 dead. 
and before you even get back even. Just, just saying. Yep. Go, go ahead. The third one, another six month base. But since this had such a meteor, mede, meteor move, meteoric move, you can barely see the six month base because I'm using an arithmetic chart on the daily time frame, and that just shows how much SMCI moved in a short period of time. But once again, like Nvidia and the Nikkei futures, this time we're up five days in a row, so even a little more powerful. And then ten days later, we triggered that ant setup. However, then we started accelerating um, with three exhaustion gaps. And that's where my kind of antenna started going off for a potential climax move or blow off top. It was up 200% on a large cap stock, which is, I've, I don't think I've ever, I've ever seen that. And I, I'm not sure, Don, if you've ever seen that in your career on a large cap stock that's gone up 200, 250% in five weeks. But anyways, we had three exhaustion gaps. And this is where I started reviewing my climax top or William O'Neill's Climax Top Sell Rules. Uh, so a few of these were met in his like checklist of 10. The first one was the largest day since the move started on the largest volume. And in this case, it was the highest volume ever. And I just wanted to point out that the context for highest volume ever matters a lot. For example, on the breakout, when they released that preliminary guidance, uh, it was the highest volume ever, but that was coming out of a six month phase. So that is extremely bullish. But after a 200% move or extended period of time, you know, when you start to accelerate and then see highest volume ever, that more so indicates stopping volume or potential change in trend. So at the same time, it had 10 days up in a row for over 83% gains. Um, and then once, I, like I said, since the breakout was over, up over 200%. At the same time, another sell rule was that when a stock goes above 100% plus above the 200 day, simple moving average, that kind of indicates exhaustive territory. SMCI was up 260% above the 200 day moving average. And then finally, it broke the upper trend line um, in this recent tight rope, and it was heading in the 12 o'clock direction. And then what really tipped it off was that the final day, it gapped up to about 1,070 area and faded completely and dropped 30% on the day um, for bearish engulfing. And now it's just, chopping around here and it's it's down more today good stuff ted um these these new guys ted and connor man they uh they know all the rules they're showing we, we took a page out of uh william o'neill had uh employees of his company as portfolio managers for different parts of the um of the firm's capital and dan and i took a page out of that book uh, last fall and set some money aside for Connor to start managing that that's not their money it was our money because there's different emotions involved when you're managing other people's money and um, they're just passing with flying colors and we're so happy to have these guys on board and we've really got a deep uh, portfolio management bench here at Revere so my hats off to those guys uh, Dan I think that's it from the uh, from the market side you can take us home Listen, folks, the reason Connor wasn't on today, I forgot to tell you, he had a little bout of bronchitis. He was worried to have a coughing spell on the show. So, so we gave him a, 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 a off today. But listen, if you like what you heard, please tell a friend, tell a neighbor, just send them to revereasset.com. In the upper right-hand corner, there's a subscribe button. We'll send them, in, and they can just put in their email and their name, and we'll send out our daily market. It's called Tomorrow's Insights. Our, it gives you what we're looking at for the upcoming day in the markets, what the probabilities are suggesting for the next day in the markets. Don does that every night the markets are open. Pretty soon, Ted and uh, Connor are going to start pitching in we also they'll get this podcast but we're not going to email them or spam them or hassle them in any way it's up to them to reach out to us if they want a complimentary portfolio review a, a stock they want or a topic they want talked about on the show and you can email any of us dan at revereasset.com uh, Don at revereasset.com or Ted or Connor at revereasset.com and you can always 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 call us old school at 855 Real Wealth. Folks, we'll talk to you next week on your money. Because it's not about how much you make in the markets, it's about how much of that you can keep. <laughs>